Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Christian Life Center. Today, Pastor and his family is on vacation, and we are going to worship the Lord and enjoy his presence here today. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Thank the Lord for that. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. Bless the Lord, O you his angels. Bless the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Father, as we prepare for worship, we give you our love. We give you our love for all the sins you've forgiven, for all the diseases you've healed, for all the benefits. We don't forget your benefits, Father. We want to thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Well, it's your lucky day because you showed up at church, and a lot of people, it looks like they're on vacation, so you get to sing extra loud this morning. So please stand and join us as we worship today, and I hope that you brought your loud singing voice. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about the note or the key that you're on. Just sing praises to the Lord this morning. Amen. It will encourage those around you. Even if you're not on the right key, it's okay. If you're praising the Lord and you're worshiping Him, we know that um, He will show up today and you will encourage those around you. So today is your day. Sing loud and proud, as I like to say. And you have to clap. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus. Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me Look 
looking forward to this day. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He taught me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me. If you have victory in Jesus this morning, say amen. Hallelujah. We do have victory. And like I said, look forward to that day. Looking forward to the mansion that he has built for us, the streets of gold, the angels singing, and um, when we get to really live out the old redemption story. So looking forward to that day. Amen. Hallelujah. dwelling place oh lord almighty for my soul longs and even faints for you for here my heart is satisfied Within your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. One thing.
on this earth, oh God. May you continue to fill us. We just worship you this morning as we look forward to that day, knowing that one day in your courts, oh God, one day is better than thousands anywhere else. Lord, when we think about the most beautiful place we've ever visited, God, it doesn't compare to one day in your courts. Hallelujah. And we look forward to that day, oh God, where we will rejoice and we will worship you all day. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. May we have a glimpse of your glory this morning, oh God. May you come this morning. Jesus, we expect that you are going to come this morning, Lord, as we already feel your presence in this place. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. your grace more than my words can say Jesus I come Jesus I come in all my weaknesses you are my confidence Jesus I come Jesus, I come. I 
will rise and stand redeemed. Heaven, open over me to your name, eternal. your cleansing blood. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. In every broken place, you are my righteousness. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. I will rise
his praises this morning. Worship him, church. Hallelujah. the wonderful things you've done for us, Lord. Thank you how you died on the cross for our sins, Father. We were not faithful, but you were faithful to us. Thank you for loving us first, Father. When we were still sinners, you died for us, Father. Thank you for saving us during the week, Father, from all of our sin, Father. All the times we, uh, we doubted you, we doubted your promises, Father. Forgive us for our unbelief, Lord. Forgive us for all the selfish things we did during the week. You do that, Lord. Thank you for forgiving us, Father. Father, you forgive us for the, the, the love. Sometimes we show love for the world and the things of the world, Father. Thank you for forgiving us, Father. Father, you forgive us for the lack of love we show to people. Sometimes we're too abrupt. Sometimes we judge people. You forgive us, Father. Thank you for forgiving us, Lord. Father, forgive us for thinking of ourselves more than others, Lord. Thank you, Father, if we've offended you or if we've offended other people. Thank you for forgiving us, Father. We ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Father, and forgive us for not hating sin the way that you hate sin. Work in our lives so that we hate sin the same way you do, Father. And Father, forgive us for our secret sins that nobody else knows about. Thank you. You do great things, Father, every day. Your love never fails. Your love never stops. Father, you show us uh, our sins so that we can repent and we can move on and we can reflect the glory of Christ to others, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love which never quits. Thank you for your love that never ends. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here that's discouraged or anyone here that's fearful or anyone here is downcast, Father, that you would encourage them today, Father. You would show them the joy of the Lord. You would show them the hope that we have. You would work in their spirit, Father, not just in their mind. You would give them the joy of the Lord. You'd give them the gift of eternal life, Father, if they haven't heard of Jesus Christ or what he did on the cross. Father, Father, we just come to you and we come to you on level ground, Father, with our sins forgiven, looking to you as humble people, looking to you because all the glory is yours. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, take five minutes and get to know someone. Say hi to someone you haven't talked to before. At this time, we're going to honor the Lord with our wealth, with our giving. Uh, we are going to worship God. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be overfilled, uh, will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Ushers, would you come forward, please? This verse talks about how in the Old Testament times, the Jewish people honored God with the giving of the first fruits of their crops, to the support of the house of worship where the priest ministered full-time to God and to the people. The giving was a thanksgiving to God for a good harvest, acknowledging that he was the source of all wealth. We no longer live in a primarily agricultural society, but the principle remains the same. When we give money to support the local church, the giving represents the fruits of our labor, whatever our occupation, and it honors God by allowing the church to carry out the New Testament, the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Also at this time, I'd like to mention that many of you are taking advantage of our online giving option, which is available through the webpage at www.clc413.com. Giving this way, you can give one time, you can have recurring giving on a schedule you choose, or you can use your, smart, your smartphone to give, 
And you can designate your giving towards any ministry or towards any mi missionary of your choice. Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. Thank you for the blessing that comes when we give to you. We honor the Lord with the f first fruits of our wealth. Thank you, Father. Uh, bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning, everyone. Just waiting for John to put the PowerPoint on. Oh, there we go. Uh, today we're going to actually talk about going, be, going from being powerless to powerful. And the first thing I want to say today is just make sure everybody realizes that you're loved, okay? And it's important that we realize that when we're being corrected, the Bible tells us that all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for correction, for rebuke, for instruction of righteousness, you know, that the man of God or the woman of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So one of the things in the church we have to get used to is, is to uh, be comfortable with being corrected. You have to be comfortable being corrected. If you're being coached in any sport and you want to be corrected, you have to, if, if you want to get good at that sport, you have to be comfortable with it. So uh, instead of looking at feeling like sometimes if you're being, if the Holy Spirit's telling you something or you're being told something that can grow you to the next level, instead of feeling like you're persecuted, realize that you're being protected, okay? And that you are loved, and that is the way that you love someone. I was talking to Jay earlier. If I was driving, if you're driving with your family down to Orlando, Florida, you're going to Disneyland, and uh, on the way down there, you're, you, you stopped off at some rest area, and you said, you told some guy, well, I'm going to take Route 40 this way towards Orlando, and, uh, you know, uh, and then I'll, I should be there by tomorrow. And he said, no, 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 that's going to put you in Memphis, Tennessee, you're going to take this route to go to Orlando, you wouldn't be upset with the person, you wouldn't be angry at the person for correcting you. Uh, that's an important thing, okay, that they told you. You'd be thankful. And the same thing when it comes to growing in the Lord, when it comes to maturing in the Lord, when it comes to becoming more powerful in the Lord. So we want to work, uh, they're talking about today, from, go from being powerless to powerful. So when, before we're Christians, before we know Jesus Christ, we're totally powerless against the attacks of the enemy. We're totally powerless against uh, the schemes of the enemy, okay? And here, here's the basic things I want you to understand. Number one, know your enemy. Who are your enemies, okay? You basically have three primary enemies. Your first enemy is the world, okay? The world involves, could involve money, riches, popularity, fame, position. If you notice in the, in, when Jesus was being tempted and the devil took him to a high place and it said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, he said, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. So one of the things the enemy will try to do is get you to, to look at the things of the world, like I say, popularity, money, fame, position, lots of friends, whatever the case might be. And if you make those things your idols, in a way you, you worship the enemy. If they become your idols, you're worshiping the devil through those things. So we've got to watch out for those things. We've got to watch out for the, the world as one of our enemies. And the second thing, and I'm going to show you all this in Scripture. This is not my opinion. I'll show you all this in Scripture. Second thing is the flesh. The flesh is your fleshly desires, what, you're, what you want, what you crave, your selfish needs and desires. And your third enemy is, as we said, the devil. And really, the devil is the root of all these things. And if you guys don't have the handouts, we do have handouts because we're going to have seven main points. You can just raise your hand. The ushers will get you a handout if you don't have one. Um, so the third one is, your, is the devil, and he's the root of all these, all these uh, things. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So as a believer, that should really strike us at the heart about how important it is not to love the world. Again, if anyone loves the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him or her. So Romans 13, 14. Put on, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So we talked about the second enemy, the flesh, to fulfill its lust. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. There it tells you right there that he is your enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. The devil wants to achieve two primary things. Number one, the devil wants to make sure you never come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So if you're not a believer, if you don't know Jesus Christ, he wants to make sure you never inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's his first primary objective. But if you do come to know Jesus Christ, he wants you to be the weakest, wimpiest Christian possible. So he, he, you know, he figures, okay, they come to know Jesus. Well, at least I want to make sure they're weak. At least I want to make their, sure they're wimpy. At least I want to make sure they're no threat to, my, to his kingdom. And either of these are a win, and he considers both these results a win in his book. What does God want? God get, gave us two great gifts. God gave us Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. 
God wants you, wants you to come to him through Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the first thing God wants. Notice it's the exact opposite of what the devil wants. The devil wants you to never come to Jesus Christ and have, as, and have eternal life. God wants you to come to him through Jesus Christ and have eternal life. The second thing that God wants is you to be a follower, a powerful follower of Jesus Christ. So sometimes we accept Jesus, but we don't really pursue it any further. We don't really, or we don't know how to pursue it any further and to become a follower, a powerful follower of Christ. I can say myself, there, were, there was a time when I loved Jesus and I believe I was a follower, but I was like a baby and I just wasn't maturing, wasn't growing. He, God wants us, he desires for us to mature. <clears throat> All right, so G this is an example of how God gave Jesus as a great gift. Of course, John three sixteen. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's uh, the new LLT version. And then another example of how the Holy Spirit is a gift from God. Acts, 1, Acts 15, 8 says, God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So you can see those examples of giving. God gave those to us. So if God gave those gifts... How crazy would we be not to receive them? How crazy would we be not to allow those things to work in your life? <clears throat> so the first question, how much of God do you want? How much of God do you want in your life? That's an important question for us to ask. Do I want this much, this much, this much? Where do, you, do you have a limit? Like, I only want this. Because sometimes the reason we only want so much of God is because the more of God we allow, sometimes the less of ourselves we have room for, right? We have to eliminate more of ourselves to allow more of God. Are you hungry and thirsty for the righteousness of God? Again, I want you to ponder these questions as they're popping on the screen. Are you hungry and thirsty for the promises of God or the righteousness of God? Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be what? Filled. He promised that. Those are the Beatitudes, right? Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. What is it that you hunger and thirst after? I can tell you myself when I was younger in the, my career and things that I did, there was things I hungered and thirst after and that's, that meant everything to me. I had to achieve those things. I had to achieve a certain level of success and popularity and this and that. And really, now I've come to the point in my life where I, I consider all those things rubbish, as Paul said, compared to the things of God. You know, so we have to consider. It's very important. You, I think A.W. Tozer, I believe, is the one that said, he said, you can have as much of God as you want. How much do you want? You know what I mean? You can have as much of God as you want. Do you want God to grow you and mature you? Again, ask yourself these questions. Do you want God to grow you and mature you? What, you know, and, and if you don't, why? Why don't you? Are, you? are you worried you would have to give up this or this or this? Are those things more important than God? <clears throat> or are you happy with the status quo? Are you happy with the way things are? <clears throat> okay, so, okay, do you desire to be a mature Christian? So we're going to go to the scriptures now. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, When I was a child... I spoke as a child, thought as a child, and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Again, in this scripture, it shows you, and he's talking about as a believer. You don't want to be, if you got born again, when you get born again, that implies like you're a baby, right? You were born again, you're a baby, right? You're born. But, and you wear diapers. Let's say you're wearing spiritual diapers. Well, what if you were born again today, and 20 years from now, you were still wearing diapers? Is there something wrong with that picture? Unless there's some physical problem, right? You, you, unless there's some physical problem, in it, but it doesn't make sense. You have to eventually take the stop, you know, go, you know what I mean, do what you do without the diapers, and uh, that would make more sense, right? So, but a lot of people don't grow up. They just stay, they keep speaking like a child, reasoning like a child. God doesn't want that. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to mature in him. Colossians, I, I love Diane's laugh too, but... <laughs> But Colossians 2, 6 through 7, it says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. So you want deep roots in the faith. And let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will what? Grow strong in, in the truth that you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Colossians 1, 9 through 10 says, So we have not stopped praying for you, since we first heard about you, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will, complete knowledge again, and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then the way you will live will always honor and please the Lord, and, you will, and your lives will produce every kind of fruit, every kind. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. So this is, again, just talking about maturing in the Lord and how do we do that. You know, so again, if you don't know how to do it, 
you know, that, that's, you, you have to have someone to show you. Or in the, it's all in the Word of God. You know, how much time do we spend in the Word of God when all the, that's life's, inst, you know, instruction book. It's like the, it's the manual for life. But do you, it's not, but it's not a bookmark. I mean, it's not a, not a doorstop. It's something to be used, right? So how to go from powerless to powerful. So point one in the notes, if you do have the notes, is seek. We need to seek the Lord, okay? If you're not born again, if you don't know Jesus, you need to seek him. And even after you are born again, you need to continue to what? Seek him. We don't stop seeking him at any point. See, sometimes people, they don't seek him, and then they're, they're miserable. They never come to know the Lord. Finally, they seek him, and they come to know the Lord, but then they stop seeking him, and they wonder why they don't grow in the Lord. We have to continually seek him. <clears throat> the Lord wants you to seek him, and his word promises that if you seek him, you will find him. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. See, maybe there'll be a time when you can't, Find him, right? So you've got to remember that. Make sure you seek him while you can find him. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, search for, the, search for the Lord and for his strength continually seek him. And that shows us that beyond salvation, we need to seek him and seek him and seek him and seek him and never stop seeking him. Hebrews eleven six. Oh, I love that scene. Hebrews eleven six says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who sincerely seek him. Other versions say, New King James, diligently seek him, right? He is, look, God, is, God exists and that he rewards, or he is a rewarder of those who sincerely or diligently seek him. You want to be rewarded by God? What do you do? Seek him. Diligently, sincerely seek him. <clears throat> Number two in your notes. If you have the notes, you just can write this in. Number two is saved. God wants you to be saved. Anyone, and, and the truth is salvation of the cross involves more than just saving you from hell. There's other things that are involved at the cross that we don't have time to get into today, but there's a lot more that was accomplished at the cross than just, just your salvation and sa being saved from hell and your, from, from your sin and hell. Once we seek him, the Lord wants us to be saved from our sin and hell through Jesus Christ. And then we should continue to seek him after we are saved, as we just said. Okay, Mark 1, 15 says, The time promised by God has come at last. He announced, The kingdom of God, uh, God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. So see, Jesus says, Repent first and believe the good news. So it's important that we see the sequencing in the, in the word. We see the sequencing. Repent of your sins and believe. You need to repent and believe. And even people that say, Well, you just, if you just need to believe, you have to repent. Because here, believing implies repenting. Why? Because if Jesus is Lord and his word tells you to turn from this and turn from this and turn from this and you don't do it, is he really your Lord? A great saying I heard years ago is you can't say no Lord and mean them both. Right? Jesus is either Lord of all or not at all. Right? He's a, so <clears throat> Romans 10.9 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now here's to clear that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God, you will be saved. These are all elements. You need to repent. You need to believe the good news. You need to declare that Jesus is Lord. You need to believe in your heart and uh, that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. These are things important to understand. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, God saved you by his what? Grace. When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. Uh, this is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Christianity is a religion no, one, no human would have ever thought of, ever. You know why? Because we like the credit. But a religion where you get absolutely no credit, you did nothing to get your salvation. I did nothing to get my salvation. No pastor, no Bible leader, no person has ever done anything to deserve their, their salvation. It's by grace. By grace. that no, You can't take credit for this. God is not a reward of the good things we have done. It says so no one can boast about it. Very important to understand that, that we, that, we, that we get that. And what is the difference, knowing the difference, justice, we deserve justice, right? Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. God, uh, mercy would be God just going, you're not getting your punishment. Grace is he gives you above and beyond that. He gives you even the things you don't deserve. <clears throat> Number three, sovereign. Number three is sovereign. Once we are saved and born again, 
have, promise, have the promise of eternal life, the Lord wants us to acknowledge his sovereignty. This means acknowledging that he is the supreme authority, not us. I heard someone once say sovereign, God's sovereignty is, could be thought of this way. God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and he doesn't need to ask anyone's permission. Now, a lot of us, how many people do you I'll do what I want. It's my life. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever. I've acted that way at times when I was younger. Other people act that way. But then if God says he's sovereign, who's perfect and created the universe and is all-knowing, we act like he's, you know, there's a, no, if anyone has a right to be sovereign, to do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and ask nobody's permission, the only one that has that right would make sense would be God. And we acknowledge he's, he is the supreme authority. We acknowledge that he is sovereign. Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Psalm 115, 3 says, Our God is in the heavens, and he does as he wishes. See, this just demonstrates his sovereignty. Ecclesiastes 3, 14. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. And that's another thing in the church. We're not talking about fear him like, oh, I'm so afraid of God. I don't want to go around God. That's not what it means. It means reverence, right? It means reverence God. And we've lost that a lot of times in the church nowadays, right? People run around church like, not, this is the house of God. And I'm going to try, but I mean, think about it. If you went and met the queen, you do a certain little bow and you can only go two inches or a certain way. But, but before God, we're like, whatever, you know. We got to get a little bit less focused on that God rocks kind of like mentality and realize God is great. God is the creator of the universe. He is your Lord. He is your master. He is your savior. You know what I mean? He's God. Reverence him. Revere him. Right? And it's talking about when it says that reverential fear. That means I don't care what man thinks. I don't care what my family thinks, what my friends think. I care what God thinks. That's reverential fear. That's the fear of God we need to have in our lives. I, I won't do this because it won't honor God. I, you know, God's before even my and before myself too. <clears throat> number four, submit. Submit is number four. <clears throat> After we admit the sovereignty, that His sovereignty, He wants us to submit to Him completely because He knows what we need better than we do. God's been doing this stuff a lot longer than any of us, right? He's been, he's never, he had no beginning. So you had a beginning, just that probably too many years ago compared to someone who never began. He knows what he's doing. He knows what we need better than we do. And sometimes we act like we don't. So we some, you challenge him. How arrogant is that to challenge the all-knowing God? You know, I'm not saying, but all of us at times have done it. If, you know, James 4, 7 through 10 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. See, some people just say, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's not what it says. What does it say? Submit to God. Submit yourselves, to, therefore, to God. I'm used to New King James. Submit to God. But Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will what? Draw near to you. See, he's not a bully. He's not going to force himself on you. For, oh, get, come here. I'm a, he doesn't do that. Draw near to God. And he'll, oh, good, I, I want to be near you. I just wasn't going to be a bully and force myself on you. So draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. There's repentance. And purify your hearts, also sanctification, uh, you double-minded. Be, re, uh, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will what? Exalt you. Humble yourself. See, the way up in the kingdom of God is down. Right? You go down, lift him up, and then he brings you up. You don't put yourself up. You let him put you up. Job 22, 21 through 23 says, Submit to God, and you will have what? Peace. How many of you could have a little more peace in your life? Right? Okay. Submit to God, and you will have peace. Wow. Then, the things, will, then things will go well for you. And, and again, it doesn't mean your life's going to be perfect. You never have problems. But Paul the apostle learned to be content when he was what, a base and abound when things were going well, when they weren't, because he had the peace of God in his life. You know, the, the peace that the Holy Spirit was one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit in his life. That's, it didn't matter where you put him. He could be being whipped, and he was singing to the midnight hour, praising God. They say, this guy is crazy. We beat him up. We threw him down in these disgusting prison you know, down here below, which was like the sewer systems, basically, of the city. They were probably in you know, feces and urine, that's the, the, the uh, scholar, Bible scholars say. And he's singing and praising the Lord to the midnight hour. They say, wow, this guy got, got, might have something here that uh, we need to know about. So, so, you will, so submit to God and you will have peace. Then the things will go well for you. Listen to his instructions and store them up in your heart. 
Store, how, and you have to read his word, going to church, reading the word, fellowshipping with other believers. Store these things up in your heart. If you return, even, even what we've talked about today, it doesn't matter if you came here today if you don't store any of this, this up in your heart. Right? You have to store it up in your heart. If you get a prophecy in church, and you go, oh, that was a great prophecy, that was a powerful prophecy, and you don't act on it. What does that mean? That's not going to do you any good. It says, return to the Almighty, you will be restored, so clean up your life. Very clear. <laughs> So if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored, so clean up your life. Romans 10, 2 through 4. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. See, they're excited about God. They think God's cool, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God. See, we don't want to be ignorant of the righteousness of God. And seeking to establish their own, in other words, their own ways, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So we need to what? Submit to God's righteousness, okay? Again, there's how many, a lot of you, if you were Christians when you were younger, you can think of times when you love Jesus. It's what's not the love? I mean, really, think about Jesus. What's not the love? You know, but you didn't totally submit to him, to his righteousness. You know, you didn't. So that's, this is the key. This is where we have to grow. In order to mature, this is what we need to do. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And number five, number five in your notes, we've got seven points in the notes, is set apart. Set apart is number five. The Lord wants us to be set apart or sanctified. This means we're set apart to God and made holy. This sanctification is a lifelong journey. So no one has arrived here. I haven't arrived, nobody's arrived. Pastor hasn't arrived, nobody's arrived. We're just a constant journey. And, and, and your, God's grace is, has to be sufficient in certain things, Right? But you need to desire more than anything to please him. Even if you look at David and all the follow-ups and mistakes he made, said he had a heart uh, after, he was a man after God's own heart. You know what I think sometimes that means? I have a different little take on how that means he was a man after God's own heart. He was after God's heart. He wanted to be dearer to God's heart more than anything. A man after, I'm after his heart. God, I, I keep messing up, but I, I want to be dear in your heart. I'm after your heart, Lord. I want to be precious in your heart, Lord. That means more to me than anything. And whatever I have to give up, I will. Please help me. He would always cry out. So that, and I think that's the only reason he could be called a man after God's own heart when you consider all the, all the things that, that David did that we could easily you know, try to cast a stone at. <clears throat> John 17, 15 through 8, uh, 18 says, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. See, God doesn't take you out. But that you, but that you keep them from the evil one. The, that's the devil. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So I say you see people go, with truth? Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Romans 12.2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. That's, I mean, don't copy the customs and behavior of this world. Right? I mean, if you listen to what God says, I've, there's never been a thing I've done in my life that God told me to do, that his word told me to do, that I regret. But how many of you guys have things that God wouldn't tell you to do or told you not to do that you regret? Right? All of us, right? It's always the things he tells you not to do or the things that go against his word that regret. You've never once felt guilty for praying, never once felt guilty for uh, sharing the gospel, never once felt guilty for reading your Bible. It doesn't work that way. When you honor God and you live for God and serve God, you're, you're, there's a blessing in your spirit. Oh, sorry, I should have finished that verse. <laughs> but, but let God transform you into a new person. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. That's first step if you want to let God, what, transform you into a new person. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And this submission is a good part of allowing how, how you allow God to uh, change how you think because the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, the Bible says, but we have the mind of Christ. People talk about how wise Solomon was. Let me tell you something. When you submit to the Holy Spirit, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, the Bible says, but we have the mind of Christ. Solomon wasn't as wise as Christ. Jesus is God. So he had the wisest human brain, but obviously spiritually we could see his brain didn't always you know, work the way it should have. As mine doesn't. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. See, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Once you give yourself to Christ, you're not yours anymore. You don't belong to you. 
Don't say, I'm mine, this is my life, I'll do it. It isn't your life. If you're a Christian, it isn't your life, it's his life. If you're not a Christian, it is your life, and it's actually really the devil's life, even though you think it's your life. Galatians 2.20 says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. See? Crucified. Just like Christ was, I've crucified myself. We didn't have to suffer all the pain and punishment and beating and scourging and thorns that he had to, you know, or take all the sin of mankind on ourselves in one moment. But we're crucifying ourselves and saying, I'm done. I'm dead. I live for Christ now. I'm being resurrected and just serve Christ. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Number six, point number six, set free. Number six is set free. <clears throat> the Lord wants us free from strongholds that harm us and don't honor him. Whatever it, whatever it may be, everyone has strongholds. We must identify them and allow the Lord to set us free from, bondage and from the bondage of these strongholds. If you don't know you have any strongholds, I can tell you one thing, you're not seeking the Lord in prayer, and you're not asking them to reveal things to you, because everybody has a stronghold. It may not be some crazy, outlandish, horrible but thing by man's definition, but there's something there that's not honoring God, that's holding you back from growing in God. And we need to constantly ask God to reveal things in his time, because there's sometimes when he'll, he'll say, no, I'm going to save that for later. They're not ready for that yet. Let's, let's work on this now. And then, okay, you know, it, but it, that's why that sanctification is a process. So all of us have strongholds. Okay, these strongholds can, can be demonic oppression or influence. Yes, there are demons, guys. In fact, that, like that saying is kind of true. It's not in the Bible, but it says the best thing, the, the most effective thing the devil's ever done is to convince people that he doesn't exist. Because then they blame God. Why would God allow this? Do you ever remember that there's the devil too? And he's the one that wants those things, not God. That God says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he gives you the answer, goes, choose life. It's like a multiple choice no-brainer. I set before you A, life, B, death. And he goes, choose life. And then people choose death. Whose fault is that? If your teacher in class gives you a question, gives you the answer, you pick the opposite just to be disobedient and rebellious, and you fail the test, you're going to blame their teacher? Does it make any sense? So these strongholds can be demonic oppression. They could be fear. Could be drug or alcohol addiction. Could be hate, prejudice, perverse thinking, jealousy, unforgiveness, certain types of sickness. And I'm not saying because you're sick that you're, that's because you're evil. Or, it's saying that there's, there's certain things that you can be delivered from. That's something that, that the Lord can, can heal you from and deliver you from. And the enemy can be trying to hold you captive through. Gossiping complaining, anger, rebellion, or any number of possible strongholds. God wants to set us free by the power of the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.1 says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. Christ has, Christ has truly set us free. Romans 6, 7 through 11 says, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives to the, for the glory of God so that you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive through Christ Jesus. John 8, 3, 34 through 38 says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And a slave, uh, is, a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, that's Jesus, you are truly free. Other versions say free indeed. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. I am telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. You know who he's talking about. Acts 16, 16 through 18. This is interesting. Now it happened as we went to prayer. That, now notice they're going to prayer. This is interesting when this happens. That a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So she actually had this power of fortune telling, but it was from the enemy. It was from Satan. It says, and the girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servant of the most high God and proclaim to us the way of salvation. See, that's why it's not enough just to believe because the Bible actually says demons believe, right, and tremble, but they, they don't repent. They can't repent, but you know what I'm saying? They, don't, they, they believe that Jesus is Lord. They know that. 
right? But they don't honor him with their, they don't, says, so she, she knew, said, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. And I, this next part is interesting. It was a real good revelation for me when God showed me this little, little nugget here. It says, but Paul greatly annoyed. Paul the apostle who wrote more of the test, New Testament than anyone else, more than any of us, right? Got greatly annoyed. You can get annoyed as a Christian sometimes. If the enemy is attacking you, sometimes it's, you don't want to be quick to get angry. You want to be slow to speak, slow to, you know, but you, there, sometimes you can get annoyed. And sometimes you can fire back boldly through the power of the Holy Spirit to take down that stronghold. See, the devil wants, you're a Christian, you got to be nice, you got to handle everything perfectly and calm. Sometimes you got to go to war. That's why we call it spiritual warfare. That's why the Bible says, put on the full armor of God. Why would we have armor if there wasn't warfare? So we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spirits of darkness in the heavenly places. It's warfare, guys. It's combat, okay? But the enemy would love for you not to think it, that you can't get annoyed, you can't get bothered. If it's spiritual, like God gets righteous anger, right? Even God is slow to anger, but it's righteous anger. Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it says, and he came out that very hour. See, we can't blame the woman. It wasn't her. It was he, the, the spirit, the demonic spirit. See, and he, it doesn't say, look, she come out of her, and he came out of her. So we know who is the blame. It's not her. It wasn't, she was, she was, I mean, she might have submitted at a certain point to some demonic influence and the fortune telling and all that, which made her, but you get what I'm saying. It was the demon that was causing that. So some pe people need to be set free from these things. You're set free, act like it. I heard a story about a bear. Jensen Franklin told this great story. The bear that was in a 12-foot cage. These people were just, they trapped it and were just horrible to the bear. And it would walk back and forth in this 12-foot cage. Back and forth. Back and forth. And it would just walk this cadence back and forth in a 12-foot cage. And people would come by and throw rocks at it, poke it with sticks and make fun of it. Things they would do if it was out of the cage too, you know. But uh, they, 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 but, but anyway, so they, they would just torment this bear and torture this bear. Well, someone found this and was able to rescue the bear. And they brought the bear to this beautiful, beautiful rescue. It was out in the, this you know, vast uh, land of like where they had water and lakes and rivers, and it could just roam and, and enjoy itself. Well, when they let it out of the when they took it out of the cage and put it out there, guess what it did? It just started walking back and forth in a 12 foot cadence, walking back and forth because it was trained and conditioned to do that. Well, when you're set free by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're, th those attacks of the enemy that just keeps you, you know, you're free, but sometimes you don't know you're free. No one told you you're free, right? You can, you can roam around. you got a lot more freedom. you got a more, lot more power. You're able to do a lot more than you were. And, and if someone attacks you, you can attack back now. Trust me, they won't be throwing stones and poking them with sticks once he's out of that cage. You see what I'm saying? But he didn't know. He didn't know. Number seven, spirit empowered. And this is really the crux of the whole thing. <clears throat> God wants the Holy Spirit working in us and out of us. Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. If you look at the life of Jesus, you're going to see every facet of his life. How many times the Holy Spirit said it? The Holy Spirit was there in the conception of Jesus, Luke 1.35. The Holy Spirit was in the baptism of Jesus, Luke 3, 21 through 22. The Holy Spirit was, in the was there with the temptation of Christ. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. See, he was, but he was, he, even Jesus, our Savior and Lord, made sure he was led by the Holy Spirit and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit before he even dealt with that temptation. We get saved... We don't even depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And the devil's attacking all the time. That doesn't make any sense. Again, if Jesus knew he needed to be led and empowered by the Holy Spirit, then certainly we do. And he came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit after his temptation. Luke 4, 14. The Holy Spirit at the cross. We even see the Holy Spirit at the cross, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from the dead, from dead works to, uh, to serve the living God. Hebrews 9.14. Who, who through, see, the, shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, with one of the names, one of the names of the Holy Spirit, offered himself without spot to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Holy Spirit in the resurrection. We see the Holy Spirit in the resurrection. Romans 1.4. And he was shown to be the Son of God. Jesus was showed, revealed to be the Son of God. It says, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see how important the power of the Holy Spirit is? Are we figuring something? Some people say that ceased. That was for years ago. That makes no sense. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. So he meant it to them, but he's going to leave everybody else as orphans. I'll, I'll leave those. I won't leave those ones as orphans, but the followers that love me and serve me later, I'll make them orphans. It doesn't make any sense. He gives you a gift. Now I'm taking it back from you. I'm going to give it. I'm going to take it. It doesn't make any sense. It's just they're not using it. If I, if I give someone a gift, if I say, if you come here, come here for a minute, if you don't mind, please. And, uh, and I said, look, here's a gift, right? I've got a gift for him, and I'm going to give him the gift. He can take it. Or, so if he takes it, He's got it that quick. See how quick you can receive the gift? And I, t but, and I take it back. So he just, all he's got to do is just take the gift. But if he takes it and takes the gift and puts it over here and doesn't use the gift, it's not going to do him any good. Okay, thank you. Sir. Just, but you guys make sense? You need, if once he gives you that gift, you need to use the gift. The Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we see the Holy Spirit obviously at Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And it, you know, one of the uh, things that you'll see in the, uh, some versions say, say they, were, they were together in one accord too. That's important too, that, that we're all in one accord as brothers and sisters in Christ. Realize when we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, we become brothers and sisters. Do we really treat each other like brothers and sisters? Do we really love each other like brothers and sisters? Realize that the people that are here that are saved, that know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you're going to be with forever. Right? We're going to be with forever. We need to learn to love each other. Okay? <clears throat> the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. Now we see the Holy Spirit in the, in the Word of God in the Scriptures. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the sword of the who? The Spirit, not your intellect. Not your Bible school training. It's the sword of the Spirit, right? And who should we allow to wield the Word of God through us? Our intellect, our Bible school training, or the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, because it is the sword of the Spirit. It's not your, spirit, your sword to wield. It's His sword to wield. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So this is in our lives. And these... This, we could, this pastor could do a 10-month series on this. We just scraped the surface. So I'm going to give you an overview about the Holy Spirit. Please don't think in any ways this is exhaustive or meant to really like, inform you completely about everything. It's just an overview. So you, I'm going to encourage you guys, maybe write some of these scriptures down and study it yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life that, that we will also have some time at the end for prayer. Holy Spirit helps us to become more effective, and we're going to get to the scriptures in a minute. The Holy Spirit gets, allows us to be more effective in our lives, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. He helps us overcome and prevail in spiritual battles and will help us to pr pr boldly proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ to those who need it. John 16, 7 through 9 says, But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. This is Jesus speaking. Because if I don't, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, won't come to you if I do go, if I don't, if I, it won't come, I'm sorry. He goes, if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Again, he'll send the Holy Spirit to you, to him. Uh, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin. See, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. But that's not to make you, to be horrible. It's to protect you. See, but that's another thing. A lot of people nowadays don't want any conviction. Don't have any conviction in the service, in the church. Well, if the Holy Spirit convicts you, if he, if he thinks it's okay to convict, I'm not, I don't need to convict you anyway. But it's the word of God, the Holy Spirit, that will convict you. Why, why are you so uh, bothered by being convicted? If you feel it's the Holy Spirit, don't be bothered by it. Because it's going to help you. It's going to help me. It's going to grow us. We need, to, we need to realize that's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. Why would we resist the Holy Spirit? So it says, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness. He's going to also convict them of God's righteousness. And of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So you have several aspects of the Holy Spirit, too. When you're born again, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's like the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But then baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's a different thing. Baptism, by definition, it can't mean the same. Because remember, Jesus breathed into the Holy Spirit. But baptism always means the word immersed. And there's two ways you can be immersed. There's the pool and the waterfall definition. If I jump into a pool of water, I'm going to be what? Immersed in water. If I walk under a giant waterfall, the biggest Niagara Falls, I'm going to be immersed in water. 
One, we go down and up. One comes down on us. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is the baptizer. It says he will baptize you with the, with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's the baptizer and the Holy Spirit that comes from above. So it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses and telling the people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice he started at home, the area around you, you know, a little further, and then all around the earth. So this is something that God wants. You receive power. So if you want power, you have to have the Holy Spirit come upon you. You have to be baptized by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. And then you will be his witnesses. One of the signs of a person that's baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's not just speaking in, tongue, speaking, speaking in tongues, which is real, but it's that you'll be his witnesses. You'll, he says, you will, not you might, when, you're, when, you're, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. He guides us, the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 says, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Strengthen us. Ephesians 3, 16 says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And again, I'm just give, I just want you to understand what the Holy Spirit does. You know, you're not going to remember all this. It's not, like I said, exhaustive. But it's just it's important for the entire church to understand that. Then you can get into your Bibles, study this, learn this, and, you know, and, and as pastor speaks in the future, talking about the Holy Spirit, you're going to realize how important is it that I pay attention to the Holy Spirit. If Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit, you know, then we need to. Empowers us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. Acts 1a, again, it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He empowers us. That's, I know we had that scripture earlier, but I'm emphasizing the aspect that he empowers us here. He comforts us. Acts 9.31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. They grew. The church grew. Walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. John 7, 8, 38 through 39. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered, yet entered his glory. Holy Spirit is a fruit giver. Okay, this is important to know. It gives fruit, builds fruit in your life. 5, through 23 says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. I love that the first one is love because we have to love, right? Jesus didn't, again, didn't say, you'll know they're my servants because they went to Bible college. You'll know they're my servants because they, they, they uh, carry a Bible around with them or have a Jesus bumper. He said, you'll know they're my servants because they love one another. We have to love one another. But we also have to have a clear definition of what love actually is, too. Sometimes we come up with our own version of what love means. And, and that, that's, so, but God, we know also God is love, right? So love, we need love. The Holy Spirit will grow this fruit in your life. And fruit isn't... Uh, instantaneous like a gift i can just give you a gift and you just receive it right that's like the gifts of the holy spirit which we'll talk about briefly but fruit takes time to grow it has to be cultivated so it's like you have a fruit tree inside you a joy tree a peace tree maybe your fruit tree your your love tree is looks amazing but your patience tree is you know but usually the the love is, love is really the primary one so let's say let's say your gentleness tree is great but your patience tree is, is really like barely sprouting out of the ground right we want all the trees to be fully grown, right, cultivated with ripe, beautiful fruit on all the trees. That's what we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to do in us. And if you identify that certain fruit in your life is not what it should be, ask the Holy Spirit to do that. Study what God's Word says about that. Lord, I'm, I'm lacking in this. I'm lacking in that uh, fruit. And I, I, need to, I know that fruit needs to be more manifest and, better, and, and, and uh, more ripe and better in my life. Matthew's, in Matthew 3, I love this, John the Baptist, this is, other than Jesus, no one born of woman was, is greater than John the Baptist. He says, it says, the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, saw him and said, he said, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. That's what John said. You ever see when people say, oh, you're, you're preaching, you're mean, you're being, guys, John the Baptist, other than Jesus, no one born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. These guys come to him, don't say anything. He goes, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. And then he says, who has warned you from the, to flee from the wrath to come? See, a lot of people think they were just coming to just see him. They were, they were coming to think about being baptized, right? How do we know they were coming to be baptized? Because he said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They thought they could be baptized. And he says, 
bring forth, bring first, I'm sorry, first bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Your fruit, the, what you, the way you live, show me that you really mean it, that you really have repented. Show me fruit that proves you've repented, then I'll baptize you. But if you look at the, con- it's very clear. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He was having like some kind of word of knowledge there. And he says, first, bring forth uh, fruit worthy of repentance. If I'm going to, I'll baptize you, but I want to see fruit that's worthy of repentance. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll go back there. Okay. Matthew 7, 19 says, Jesus said, every tree that is, does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You think he was really concerned with trees that don't, it wasn't, he was talking about people, right? If you don't bear good fruit, what do we think the fire represents, right? We know, okay? There is a hell, okay? We can't just, you know, sweep it under the carpet like it doesn't exist. It does exist. And we want to want to pull people from, I heard someone say this before. He goes, the, the kingdom of God is not a luxury liner, smooth, a, cruise, a cruise ship smoothly sailing through the gates of heaven. It's a battleship manned outside the gates of hell seeking to save souls. That's, that's how we look at it. The Holy Spirit is a gift giver, okay? And this is the last part in this, uh, so he's a gift giver. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Corinthians, uh, yeah, First Corinthians 12, 1, 1 through 11 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So he doesn't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts, so you should study this. There's a lot of good stuff you could study about this, especially the Bible. He says, uh, he goes, you, know you, were, uh, you know that you were Gentiles carried away by th- these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean you can't say the words, Jesus is Lord. Obviously, anybody could just say those words. He means, say, he means to say it and mean it. I can't say it and mean that he's Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see the difference? Because some actor in a movie could just say that. That doesn't mean they're saved or that, oh, how did he do that? Without the power of the Holy Spirit. He can't say it and mean it without the power of the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts. So these are talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are difference in ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us, uh, is given by the word of wisdom and through the Spirit, and to another, the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, another faith, by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy. And to another discerning of spirits, and, and to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretations of tongues. But, this, but, but one and the same spirit works these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you look at the different, different ones, like for example, like discerning of spirits, that means you can discern a spirit. There's different spirits. You have a spirit, right? There's demonic spirits. There's angelic spirits. There's a spirit of God. A person can have a spirit on them. Like the Bible says, God hasn't given us a spirit of what? Fear but a power and a love and sound mind. So if it's a spirit of fear, you, you know it's not of God. If it's power and love and a sound mind, you know, you, so you can learn to discern this, but that's a gift given from God. A word of knowledge, God might give you knowledge about something, someone, you don't even know how you know it. He just supernaturally in that moment gives you that gift of knowledge. This person needs to be encouraged. This person needs it. But realize that beyond that gift of knowledge is a word of wisdom. It's, it's, it's actually called the word of, I should say the word of knowledge really is what it is. The word of knowledge is a word of wisdom. And a word of wisdom will tell you what to do with that word of knowledge. So if I give you, if God gives you a word of knowledge, but doesn't give you a word of wisdom, you need to pray and ask him to give you a word of wisdom so you know how to carry that out. Now faith, the gift of faith is different than the fruit of faith and different than the measure of faith. We have a measure of faith unto salvation. We have the fruit of faith, which the Holy Spirit grows in us over time. As we spend time in the Lord, we grow in faith. But the gift of faith is supernatural, instantaneous faith where you literally have that mountain moving faith. And you can't just have that and wield that anytime you want. God gives you that for an exact moment. If not, people, one person would be moving a mountain north and someone would be trying to move it south and there'd be chaos. If God wants the mountain moved north, he'll give you that gift of faith and the mountain will move north. You see what I'm saying? So, and understand, I can't go through all these because there's just too many, but, uh, you know, healings, the Holy Spirit wants, will heal people through the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes there's a miracle. A miracle can be a healing and a miracle. Here's a difference. Let's say something, you had some swelling in your ear and it was a problem in there. God could heal it. But let's say there was an inner ear missing and you prayed and it grew back. That's a what? That's not just a healing. That's a miracle. Because there was no inner ear to, in there to begin with. And God grew back. There's a miracle. See what I'm saying? So you, it's important. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. And there's a lot more to this than me. But you, you shouldn't be ignorant concerning. So get in your word. Get in the word. You know, go to the First Corinthians 12 and, and, and read that today. Study, and start asking God to reveal these things to you. Review the seven steps to becoming powerful. Seek God. Always. 
Be saved. God wants us to be saved. Saved from our sins. Saved from hell. Sovereign. God is sovereign. He's the supreme authority. Submit to God. Okay? Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Always submit to the Lord. Set yourself apart. God, I'm yours. I set myself apart for you, Lord. Do with me what you want, Lord. Set free. Ask the Lord to set you free from any strongholds or bondages, anything in your life that's holding you back from growing in the Lord or that the enemy is trying to keep you captive with. And finally, be spirit-empowered. <clears throat> As we close here, I want you to realize God's love and mercy is greater. We're at, this is the closing point here. We're, we're at, pretty much right on time. I'm pretty impressed with myself. Uh, because I, I, have the, I definitely have the gift for Gab. PowerPoint is like, you know, it disciplines me. <laughs> But uh, God's love and mercy uh, and grace is greater than your sin. So God's love, mercy, and grace is greater than your sin. Now, with all the conviction that you may have felt, and I may, everybody can feel certain, it's meant to protect you. But I can tell you one thing. God's grace is greater than your sin. God's love is greater than your sin. His mercy is greater than your sin. He loves you. He says, I set before you life and death. Choose life. He wants you to choose life. He, you know, when you look at the story of the prodigal son, he ran away. And the father didn't chase him. He didn't force him. But when he came back and he saw the son was coming back to him, he knew he repented. He ran to him, hugged him. And he thought he, the, the son just wanted to be a slave. He's like, no, 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 no. He put a ring on his finger, which is a sign of power and authority. Put a robe on him. You know, you know, you know what I mean? Put shoes on his feet and then held a big party because he was so happy that his son was lost and now he's found. See what I mean? That's the love of God. But sometimes, that, but that son also had to go through a lot of bad stuff to realize how great God was, you know? So, Seek the Lord while he can be found. Remember we talked about that scripture? Don't wait. When are you going to die? Think about it. When are you going to die? Do you really know? Anybody can die at any time. Look, you heard about that duck boat thing in uh, Branson, Missouri? Horrible. They didn't know that. They didn't know they were going to go out in a boat and, you know, lose their whole family. That's just horrible, you know? So here's what I want in our prayer time, okay? So the first thing we're going to is, is salvation. The first and foremost, most important thing is salvation. I'm going to have everybody bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. If right now you don't know for a fact that if you were to die today or some point in the future that you would, you would go to be with Jesus and you would like to make Jesus your Savior and Lord and like to know for sure that you have eternal life through Christ, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand right now. Just slip your hand up in the air. Hold your hand up in the air. Okay. Anyone else? Pastor says you never want to rush this moment. Okay, let's all pray this prayer together. And those of you that, if you know you know Jesus Christ already, and you know him as Savior and Lord, just pray this prayer with, the, with those that raise their hand. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, for sending Jesus as, to die on the cross for me. I repent of my sins. That means I turn away from my sin and I turn toward you, God. Jesus, I want to be like you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Now the next thing I want is anybody here, and this is for our believers, that totally knows you are set apart or want to be set apart to God, I'm going to ask you to come forward to the altar. If you have a problem walking or some physical issue, that's fine, but I have you come forward to the altar. We're going to pray a prayer just to be set apart to God. So if you want to be set apart to God or you are set apart to God, I would ask you that this time that you come forward to the altar, just up, up here. If God just moves on your heart and you know you want to be set apart, that, and it is a big decision, guys. It means you're saying, I'm yours, God. Do with me what you will. I'm yours. I want to serve you completely. Just take a moment here. And I'm standing up here too, of course. This is, means you're just completely giving yourself to God. It's a big decision. It's not just, it's not, it's not a small decision. It's a, it's a big decision. Giving all of yourself to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.
And you, yes, you have to give, you'll have to give up things. We have to all give up things if we want to set ourselves apart to God. All right, if anybody decides while we're praying, if you just feel the Lord talking at your heart, you want to come forward, he just puts that in your heart to come forward, then just come forward while we're praying. Heavenly Father, we lift you up, Lord God. I lift up every person here, Lord God. And Lord, we give our lives to you, Lord God. I give my life to you, Lord God. Father God, I thank you from so many things that you rescued me from, Lord. So many things that you, you took out of my life, Lord God. And so many times that you convicted me and corrected me, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for that correction. I thank you for that conviction, Lord. It's grown me, Lord God. And I pray for more of it, Lord God. I need your wisdom, Lord God. I need your word. And I pray for every person here, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we set ourselves apart to you, Father God. We give ourselves to you, Lord God. Use us in greater ways, Lord God. We need you, Jesus. We are yours, Lord. We love you when we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And when, so moving forward, I, anybody here that has uh, any sickness, if you have any sickness, anything you feel you need to be prayed for, to, if you have any strongholds or anything you, need, you feel, if you want to come forward now, you can come forward for that right now. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Sherman if you come over here. Would you come over here? And if anybody wants to be prayed for healing, and um, I'm just going to ask if you would pray for them if they want to be prayed for healing, any special healing. And then finally, spirit empowered, okay? We're gonna, the last one is for all of us, but the la this one, next one is spirit empowered. So if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you first that you, even if you want to do it from where you see, that's fine. Just if you do want to receive it, just open your hands. If you don't mind, if you would stand, that'd be great. Just open your hands like in a receiving position like you're ready to receive just say holy spirit i receive you now the bible says that if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give the holy spirit to those who ask and it says that jesus is the baptizer in the holy spirit so i want you to ask right now i want you to as you hold your hands up say lord jesus i'm asking you right now as i've submitted myself completely to you baptize me in the holy spirit Immerse me in, your, in the Holy Spirit, that I would be covered around with the Holy Spirit, inside with the Holy Spirit, and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And not only would it strengthen me, Lord, but it would allow me to share the gospel and to bless others, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the last thing, last thing, we're, we're done. We'll be out here. I'm going to ask everybody... Everybody that's a, a part of the church to come forward for this last prayer. Just come forward to the altars. And we're going to pray for unity in the church. Solidarity. And that means unity. The Bible, remember when they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's because they were unified. They were all together in one accord. So we want to know who, who's unified, who's in solidarity, who's in one accord. We'll say this prayer and then I'll let, we'll close with a, a, a worship song. Thank you, Father God. These are your brothers and your sisters. We're going to be together forever. Some brothers are annoying. Some sisters are annoying. I probably annoy some people sometimes too. But we're still brothers and sisters. I love you guys. I, I hope you guys love me. And, uh, and I know we love Jesus, you know. So let's just pray right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, bond us together through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Make us one, Lord. Holy Spirit, flow through this church. Empower this church. Produce revival in this church. Jesus, we set this entire church apart to you, Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Praise God.